So when Steffi and I were talking about uh, this panel, she started asking me about um, how men and women behave online. Do they behave differently? Well, that's an interesting question. Do they behave differently? Do we know that? If so, what are the differences? And why might they be different? And do we care about that? Um, and what are the implications for that? Like, what do we do about that if we know? Uh, might have a lot of implications for how we design our products, what kind of services we create, what kind of work environment we create for men and women. So we've assembled a really interesting panel today. It's quite diverse. We have uh, executives at very large companies, small companies, small, entrepreneur, uh, small entrepreneurial uh, freelance consulting gigs, um, and people who specialize in research, both quantitative and qualitative. People on the design side, product development side, and marketing and adoption. So I'd like to introduce to you the panelists. Um, first, Delphine Gadignol. So she is the, uh, she's the vice president at Comscore. And she has over 10 years in uh, digital market research. And she runs Comscore for France and Belgium. And Ilana Westerman, she's the CEO of Create with Context. And for the past 15 years, she has devoted her life to advocating for the importance of studying people in context, in situ, to understand their needs, their motivations, and their desires, and make sure that the design of our products um, align with users' needs and goals. We have Polly Sumner. She's a chief adoption officer at Salesforce. <laughs> Polly has over 20 years' experience in corporate IT. And more recently, she is uh, responsible for driving uh, social software in the work environment. And she has firsthand witnessed uh, the impact that this has had, especially on women in the work environment. And then Elisa Camelhort page She is the co-founder and COO of BlogHer. Many of you may be familiar with BlogHer. And she brings her vision for BlogHer to life through research by understanding how women connect and share and behave. So welcome and thank you. <laughs> so hello. Is this on? So to start off our panel I discussion, I'd like to, uh, just wanted us to have some level setting and have Delphine walk us through what we know about our users online. Um, what are the differences between men and women from a quantitative perspective? And how are they spending their time? Thank you, Irene. Um, so, do I have to do something? <laughs> okay, well, I can tell you how we're doing things, what is coming up. Oh, okay, there you go. Um, so, how we collect data so that you know where it's coming from. We have a, a panel of two million uh, people worldwide, and that they just download a piece of software on their machine, and that allows us to see a lot of things, everything they're doing online, uh, practically, we'd say. So you see uh, site visitation, but search behavior, uh, you know, uh, purchasing, but also everything that is uh, they're exposed to. That means also view, uh, viewing some online content and uh, uh, ads they're exposed to. And we have this this uh, this ability to report this information in uh, 43 markets um, so far. So when we uh, talked about the you know the connected woman, um, there was those three areas where you know this is a. Uh, uh, coming up, so we have the mobile world where you know the, we sort of see that uh, half of the mobile users are now going to uh, use the uh, uh, internet through their mobile, and of course the adoption of the smartphone is is uh, due to to, to that. Um, so for us, it's also to identify all those synergies between the different worlds, so between the, uh, the different touch points of the, the consumer. So you have the mobile, the PC, the, and now the tablets, and anything else that can happen also in in the future. Um, and all those, you know, time spent is growing everywhere, especially like on video uh, consume, consumption is, is, is booming as well. A lot of social networking also is, uh, uh, um, a lot of time is spent on social networking. So this is a lot of uh, things for us to change uh, coming up and uh, a lot of things, a lot of challenges for us as well. 
Um, so how does it stand you know, so far? Uh, so women are still outnumbered by, uh, by men uh, worldwide, uh, but actually it is really like close to 50-50. Um, here in Germany, for example, it's more like 54% you know, men, 46% uh, female, maybe the further south you go, then the, this, this proportion goes to skew towards men. Um, but you know, so there are still some, some countries where you know, this, this uh, proportion is reversed. So like New Zealand, Venezuela, Ireland, and even North America. So I'm surrounded by you know, American ladies, so they, they would know that. Um, actually, they sp the, the good thing is that they spend more time online. So worldwide, they spend like 3% more. So we're talking about a range of 20 hours a month uh, uh, spending time online. So of course, it's PC-based, this, this part. Uh, of this could change also with, with the mobile, as I said. Um, and there are some, some um, um, countries like also like Hong Kong, for example, where women are spending a lot more time than men, almost double. So you see there are some, some differences locally. Um, what women are attracted to, so, uh, so those are also the, the kind of uh, side categories that uh, men could be interested in as well, but they, the reach is higher for, for the, the women into those categories. So portals, services would be email, uh, IM. Uh, conversational media would be blogs or social networking sites, uh, search speaks for itself, and entertainment is all about music, TV, radio, things like that. Um, does it mirror the, you know, internet mirrors the, the real life? So we can see that um, um, actually women, I was saying, like less women maybe uh, uh, spending time on, on social networking sites, but actually just, sorry, less women on social networking sites, but they're spending more time. So on those top those five uh, uh, top m uh, uh, networking sites, so Facebook, Twitter, F Windows Live Profile, LinkedIn, and uh, MySpace, you know, we can see that women are spending more time on those, on those sites. So when you think about, you know, as a marketer, or you know, if you think where you want to reach those women, well, you think that they're spending more time on those sites, uh, which makes you know, value to, to the marketers for just to get that, that knowledge. And, and of course, you know, there are still some cliches that we cannot deny. So yes, women are interesting in, in retail. Um, a, a lot of women, you know, of course, you can see that a lot of them are uh, visiting those specific sites, retail sites, so for apparel, uh, coupons, which would be like Groupon, for example, or uh, jewelry and accessories. And they're spending a lot more time, again, on, on those, uh, those sites. So there's no, you know, so, so some, some of them will still remain. Um, so when we talk about also like those savvy, you know, technology, sorry. Uh, well, it's a panel. So we recruit those people online and then, you know, we don't recruit on quotas. So once we have all those panelists, we then extrapolate to the online population. Oh, it's from some countries, it's from six, actually in the US it's two that exist, uh, web users at two, two years old, but uh, yes, from six to whatever. Uh, and in some countries it's 15 uh, due to legal reasons. Um, so this is just a look at the, uh, the mobile usage. Um, so you can see there are more uh, women actually uh, using mobile. Uh, but of course the, uh, the adoption of smartphone is, is, uh, is, uh, is higher for, for the men. Um, and actually sending text messages remain the, the the biggest uh, um, uh, usage of, of mobile, uh, it's about 34% of uh, all mobile users are texting. So that's remain the, the main uh, uh, category of, of, of usage. Um, of course, when, you know, the, the age also matters and like what you do with your mobile. So uh, of course, maybe the more mature you are, the more you're interested in news or uh, actually getting into emails rather than the younger audience would be more into chit chatting, uh, so using uh, so, uh, social networking and, and uh, uh, internet mess uh, sorry, um, instant messaging. And also, of course, you know, this is all the medium for, for advertising. So how do uh, people react also to mobile ads? Do they recall uh, seeing mobile ads? Uh, so actually, men uh, tend to recall more the mobile ads, so mobile ads, as they would have seen on apps and uh, mobile browsing. Um, so, and it's still like a younger age. So, but there's still like some, some catch up to do because online, so that's on the back to the PC world, then it's actually a lot of ads are, ex you know, a lot of women are exposed to ads. So there's still a way to, to, uh, to reach them uh, through advertising. And I think also men need a, a little persuasion. So this was uh, uh, this, this measure, so the, li the lifting share of choice is just to, to measure the, uh, the behavior of uh, the consumer, how they choose, you know, uh, products according to the same, you know, they would have the same interest for those products 
uh, but they were shown some ads and actually they can see that women are more um, well, more maybe likely to, uh, to recall those ads and actually to choose versus, versus men uh, from the ads they've seen. Uh, whereas the, the recall is the same, but women are more maybe affected by, by the ads. Um, we are talking about also like online video, so uh, it's still outnumbered also by, by men, um, but more and more women are spending time, especially on YouTube, for example, so they could find also, this is also a way for marketers to find them here as well. Um, and just a quick look at how cross-platform usage, um, so this is for the UK, uh, the UK market, so more and more people are using cross uh, cross media, so not only TV as, as uh, well, TV remains the, the, the predominant uh, way of uh, looking at TV um, uh, content, but more and more also cross media. So, and you can see that actually women are using more TV and online as a way to, uh, to watch them some TV content. In terms also, I'm going quickly, right? Um, so in terms also watching the, uh, uh, those contents uh, uh, online, then there are more maybe likely to watch it like very soon after the, the, the content has been uh, broadcasted. Uh, in terms of time spent, we've seen that the women are tend to spend uh, maybe less time and uh, maybe men are actually watching longer uh, type of content uh, and, and women would, would uh, see shorter content. And as we've seen is they, uh, that women are likely to engage with advertising and this can affect also their choice you know, their cons as, as consumers. So this is something that we need to, to remind as well. And just th that final slide where we, we said that uh, those uh, UK, the young UK people would say, you know, they spend more time. Uh, this is just for the online viewing, whereas, you know, in time spent browsing the, uh, the internet, that is really, really 50-50. Thank you. Thank you, Delphine. That's really interesting. And uh, it's, it really helps set some context and background for the rest of the discussion. So, uh, in product development, we often say that uh, for the qualitative research, tells us the why behind the what, where the quantitative research is the what. And much of what Alana works on gives us insight into the how and the why. So with that, I'd like to take it over to Ilana. Maybe, um, so I'd love to hear, uh, maybe you could tell us more about uh, what you're seeing and how that compares with the research that Delphine presented. But before you go into that, maybe you can um, share with everybody the kind of research that you do, the methodologies that you use, Sure, thank you, Irene. Um, we tend to do really deep qualitative work. So the type of research we do is go and really observe people in their environment, really trying to understand deeply who they are, what they're trying to achieve, what their underlying goals and motivations are. And this isn't necessarily always something that they can tell you or articulate, but things that you observe in their environment, behaviors that you, that you observe that they've done, and we use a lot of storytelling techniques. So we ask people to tell us, like reflect on past experiences, and we use that as a form of data collection. But it tends to dovetail very well with the quantitative uh, work, and we tend to use it as kind of a springboard to say, okay, we're seeing this in the quantitative, let's go out into the qualitative and understand the whys behind the whats. So um, one of the things I know you were asking me about is what are the differences between men and women online? And I think one of the things that we really see is, and we do research all over the world, so we get asked that question too about, well, what's the difference about, uh, between people of culture? And I think the number one thing that we do see is people are more similar than different. So before I get into the differences, I think I would just like to say that overall we're all people. And men and women, you know, for the most part, behave more similarly than differently online. But there are some key areas with their differences. And I think the other thing I'd like to just say before I get into it is I, not all women, I mean, this is a very large demographic, to talk about women in a general sense, just be very careful to know that not all of us fall into these trends. Um, but one of the things that we really see about women, especially when they're interacting with technology, is they tend to be very outcome focused. So what they want to do is they want to do something with a piece of technology. They tend not to be so interested in how it works necessarily or the specs or the features and functions. So one woman we went to talk to last year, and I think Elisa, you might have been there with us, um, she wanted a new digital camera. And the reason she wanted this camera was she wanted to take pictures of her daughter. She wanted to blow them up to post her size, and she wanted it to, uh, to be real pixelated. Sounds good, and her current camera didn't work so well. She blew them up and there were all these pixels and it looked bad. So she's looking for a new camera. She's like, you know, I don't care about 10.2 megapixels. I don't care about 13.3 megapixels. I care about what this camera is going to do for me. 
So when women are really looking to purchase and to use technology, it really is more about an outcome. How is it going to work for me? And then when they have the technology, they tend to use it more, we call it by feel. So less about forming a mental model about how maybe everything works on the inside, but more about how it feels to use it. So another woman whose home we went into, and I don't know if you have this in Europe, but in the United States, our microwaves have very funny buttons on them. And so we walked into her home, and she was popping popcorn for her kids. So we asked her, we're like, oh, tell us how you did this, how you, how you pop popcorn. Kind of a strange question to ask someone. And she's like, well, no, I just stick it in the microwave, and I press five, which means five minutes. And she goes, and then I listen, and then I smell, and then I know when my popcorn's done. So we look at her microwave, and there's a button on her microwave that says popcorn. <laughs> so we ask her, like, do you ever press that button? She's like, nah, you know, it's just, it's, it's just how it feels. I just, I can feel, you know, when the popcorn's done. And we saw that same behavior when we asked women about how they use their washing machines, about how they use remote controls, all sorts of things, is it's more by feel. And I think that really comes from the fact that it's more about the outcome. It's less about the technology itself. And I think what we see the problem is, is then we see lots of ease of use problems with women because they don't necessarily know how the technology works. And this doesn't mean that they're not capable. Women are very capable, are very smart, and they could figure out how it works, but they don't necessarily care. And so they run into issues with very complicated products, and we see this really heavily with home entertainment. So if you have five remote controls in front of you, and you have 16 devices that are all hooked up together, that typically maybe your husband hooked up together for you, you have no idea how to turn your television on. And I think <laughs> this week we saw this over and over again. And uh, <laughs> see, you guys know what I'm talking about. And um, the other thing that happens is women become very embarrassed. And almost all the women that we interviewed had some story about a piece of technology, whether it be a smartphone or their television or something, that they didn't know how to use maybe in a public situation, and they became embarrassed. And I think that's a real challenge that I, I put out there to marketers and product developers is because you know if someone becomes embarrassed using your product, they don't love your product, right? And they definitely don't want to upgrade to the next version of your product because the last thing they want is another feature or function. And so it's a real opportunity to really, it, it, again, and I think there's some simplification that happens where people say, oh, well, women just don't know how things work. That's not it at all. It's about creating products that's more about directing them to outcomes and less about the features and the functions and the widgets on it. We've all been there. <laughs> So what, what kind of um, unmet needs do you see in men versus women based on your research? Like, are, uh, you, you mentioned that at, at core we're mostly the same, but are men's needs fundamentally that different from women's? And uh, do you think uh, people who make products, that companies that are making products for people are sufficiently meeting women's needs? Again, overall, I think in general there's more similarities than differences, and there's more similarities people, you know, and how people interact. But there are some core differences that I think hap that, that people aren't necessarily consciously thinking of. It's so like a lot of our clients, it's, they have a lot of male engineers that engineer the products. And it isn't that they're sitting there saying, okay, I'm going to build a product for a man and not for a woman. It's just inherently when people are building products, they think about themselves. It's just human nature. So because I think we have so many male engineers designing and creating products, I think that is in part why sometimes there's a mismatch. But I think one of the areas that we did, um, actually some research with Blog Her last year that was really interesting, was looking at women in e-commerce. Because we know that women like to shop, and we know, as, as you find too, that I guess we're the largest, uh, I forgot the statistic, but we, we definitely, in the United States, are how many, seven trillion a year? I don't know. Lots of online shopping. But what we see is women are having struggles with a lot of the mental models and the design with online shopping sites. And one of the really interesting things we found was that women have a very fluid decision-making kind of process. So they might come into the shopping experience, even if they've done research, for like even a technical product, with a couple of features and functions that they think they might want. So a good example is we talked to a woman who wanted a big screen TV. And so she'd just gotten a bonus from work, so she knew about how much money she wanted to spend. And she knew where she was going to put it in her home, so she knew about the size that she wanted. And she had a Sony before, and she's like, Sony's a good brand, so I'll go with the Sony again. And so she goes online, and the way most e-commerce sites are set up, you have to pick your criteria, and it whittles you down and down the funnel. And so you pick how much you want to spend, you pick your, your size, you pick your LCD versus LED. And she's like, okay, well, I got these five TVs, but they were all ugly. And they were all got this big silver banner. I'm not going to put that in my living room. So she said, I left the site, I went to the store, 
And guess what? I came home with a Samsung, an LED. I spent more than I originally wanted to spend, but you know, it was worth it because I really feel like it's more of a piece of art in my living room. And so e-commerce sites really are not designed right now to really for, for us to make those types of fluid decisions. They're designed more for criteria, 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 answer. And so I think that's an area that really could see, you know, benefit and, and, and increase revenues day one if, if it was designed for that type of decision making. Okay, so take note, there's a huge opportunity there. Money, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so while we're talking about unmet needs, uh, let's switch over to Blogger. So Elisa, tell us about the need that you identified when you uh, founded Blogger. Uh, great, thanks. Um, so we founded Blogger in 2005, and I actually founded it with two other women. We did not know each other. We weren't friends. We weren't colleagues. We met through serendipity, I like to say, but one of them I met through Lisa Stone. I met through a mutual friend, and I met Jory Desjardins sitting next to her at a conference and striking up a conversation. And uh, so look around you, because your next co-founder might be out there. Um, but the, the problem that was happening is that the blogosphere was starting to really grow. And be, it was starting to be that the mainstream was paying attention to it and looking to bloggers for opinion, for perspective, for expertise. And there's money in that. There's money in being recognized. There's opportunity. And we were starting to see the same patterns of sort of the network, the old boys kind of network happening uh, with the blogosphere that was happening offline in that a lot of the male reporters were quoting the male bloggers who never seemed to link to the female bloggers. And in fact, it culminated with one blogger saying, "Why? where are all the women who blog? And, his, and it was a rhetorical question because he had the theory that women don't blog, particularly about politics, because they don't want to mix it up and participate in the rough and tumble world of the political blogosphere, and they don't want to support their ideas and, and uh, debate them. And so, of course, the many, many women who were blogging about politics, including me, um, were pretty outraged. And when I met my co-founder, Lisa, for lunch, um, because a friend said we should, she said, you know, what if we just, what if we, we could all keep talking about it on our blogs, that's what bloggers do, but what if we did something? And what if we had a conference that was like all these other tech and blogging conferences that people complain about that don't have women speaking, and we covered all the same topics. And we didn't actually talk about gender, but just talked about politics and technology and travel and food and whatever the, the subjects were and HTML and CSS, but all the experts were women. Do you think anyone would be interested? And I said, well, I would like to go to that and you know, we should just do it. And so we did. And we pulled Jory in and 120 days later we had this sold out 300 person conference. But what we learned by doing that was that there was this huge community out there and a huge passion and a huge opportunity. And what women wanted was for their voices to be heard. What they wanted was to find other women who cared about the same things they did. And they wanted to make money doing it if possible. Not everybody, not every blogger, but a significant segment said, I love this and I'm good at it. Is there a model here? And so we said, I think if we work together, there's a model here. And that's why we created our co web community and our publishing network and went out to the world as a group you know, of women with a million uniques uh, in our first sort of beta phase. We grew to that all on our own bootstrapping for two years. Um, and then we decided we needed to really scale. Everyone was starting to pay attention to the women's space because of that 80% of spending being controlled and all the trillions of dollars. We didn't want to be leapfrogged over by a mainstream company that had deeper pockets, so we did then go out and get venture funding. Now we reach 25 million uniques a month across our network, and we help 2,500 women make money every single month. And they come from all walks of life, and they blog about all different topics, and they're doing something they love. And to us, the need was this, this need for women's voices and perspective to be spotlighted. And the ultimate goal, I suppose, of the company is to not be necessary anymore, but I don't think we're there yet. What are your thoughts regarding creating a separate forum for women? Uh, do they risk being ghettoized or creating an echo chamber where the men aren't listening to the women or they're just talking to themselves? I mean, what, what, what are your thoughts on ways to make women's voices and interests more mainstream? 
Yeah, that's a, it's a good question, and it's, it's interesting because as the founder of Blogger, you would think it was a little odd that I'm uncomfortable a little bit with things like TED Women and DLD Women because those were established organizations that were supposedly for everybody, right? And so why not bring more of the women's content and speakers and interests and tracks and issues into the main organization as opposed to Blogger that was formed from day one and has it right in its name. Hello, we're targeting women, you know. So I'm conflicted uh, about it. Um, but I think there's a difference between uh, separatism and solidarity. And I think bringing people together to form bonds and to find, to do networking and to find colleagues and to get education and to give confidence and to give training, because those are all part of what we do online and at our conferences, that sends people out there to go make that change in the world. And, you know, I don't think anybody's asking where are the women who blog anymore. And I think that's a good thing. So, um, shifting over to Polly, um, because we we're talking about uh, how women are using social media tools to communicate with each other. And Polly, you've kind of overseen within Salesforce um, the social enterprise. What is that? And what does it mean for women? One of the things that um, we do at Salesforce is kind of look at what happens in the consumer web and then bring those experiences and the kinds of things that are happening there into enterprise applications so that companies and corporations can change. And that's really important and it's really important for them to be successful. So we see a fundamental shift in what's happening in IT and in technology and certainly in sort of the way that companies interact internally. So the first one is uh, thinking about um, how do you interact with the public social network, things like uh, Facebook and Twitter and lots of blogging sites and wikis and all of that, but more importantly, how do you do that? How do you find out what's being said about your company, your products, your brand, um, and do that in a way where you can listen and you can engage with that consumer or that distributor or that person in your value chain? So that's the first one. The second one is a huge trend that's happening inside of companies to build their own private social network. And at Salesforce, we have a product called Chatter. We launched it about a year ago. It's the fastest growing product we ever had. We have about 80% uh, um, of our customers have turned it on. And it's interesting. Think of it as Facebook for the enterprise. And can you imagine what happens in a corporation when there's 100% transparency between the CEO of a Fortune 1000 company and the person that works everywhere in his business. So no longer do you, as the leader, have to have every message translated for you. You actually can see and learn what's going on about your employees, what they care about, what their ideas, et cetera, that are happening inside your company. So we talked just a little bit ago about the kind of rise of a voice in the consumer world. And, and this is really about how do I create a new culture around individual contributors, transparency, et cetera, in the, in the network world. And the third area, which we alluded to in the last uh, discussion about technology trends and the rest of it, is what happens if my products can be social? What happens if my car becomes my friend? It talks to me. It tells me when it needs gas. It tells me when it thinks that its radiator is going to overheat. It reminds me of where I need to go shopping or something like that. And so we're just starting in this era of where it's not just being social with people, but it's also being social with products, all enabled by the kinds of things we talked about in the last session around technology of networks, et cetera. So that's the way we think about the social enterprise. Public, uh, inside your company, called private, safe and secure, and then with your products and uh, other extensions. So, uh, can you, uh, let's see. Um, one of the aspects of the social enterprise is to connect the company with uh, public social networks. Mm -hmm. So what are the consequences for customer service? And is there a difference between, uh, in the expectation level for service? Yeah. You know, there's a really, maybe the way to bring this home is, uh, there's a really cool YouTube video by KLM. So they took and decided that they wanted to uh, listen out on the network and create a new experience for you as a person who was waiting for an airplane. Waiting for an airplane is kind of boring, don't you think? You kind of sit around there for an hour and a half. And so they said to themselves, what could we do on the public network? Find these people that are waiting for planes and actually create a very different experience for them. What if we could deliver to them a surprise? So they took this notion of changing and innovating customer service by listening out on the network, finding people in the airport, and you gotta watch this video, and surprising them with a little gift while they were sitting there. 
And in order to do that, or when they were done, they generated like one million tweets, which created more and more goodwill and brand enhancement in the marketplace. So my personal view is, and I think it's being proven by tons of our customers, and hopefully some of you are starting to experience it as well, but the more we can understand the social profile of an individual, the better we can innovate and deliver customer service to that in a new and uh, very innovative way. Well, if I can add one Please. consequence of one consequence of having your voice and having new tools constantly developed where your voice can be heard is your expectations, as you asked about, completely change. So I expect that, and I can certainly tell you that our community members expect that they can blog her, they can tweet blog her 24/7 with a question or problem, even though there's a tech support email, even though there are other ways to get support, they expect a human to be on the other side of a tweet and answer. Is it frustrating sometimes as a company that like I want to get some sleep sometimes? You know, it can be frustrating. It's not always the most efficient for the company, but it is the expectation of the user that they will have more input, that they and that they will not only have input but that you will respond. That's really the change, is that we always had a way to give our feedback. Well, now it's instantaneous, and we want a feedback loop. And everyone talks about the power of it for the consumer, but there's a lot of power in it for the company, because you never got to hear your customers at the very beginning of their rant, at the very beginning of them starting to get annoyed with you. You never knew. It was, it was lost to you until that you lost them as a customer. And now you can listen in at any times and find people at all stages of their feelings about you as a company or brand, and you can take steps to interact and do something about it. It's very powerful, not just for the consumers, but for the companies too. So Polly, do you think that uh, the corporate social network that you use inside Salesforce gives women an opportunity to, um, d does it open up more opportunities for them in ways that they haven't had before? Yeah, it's very interesting. As I said, we have um, 80,000 customers today. These are actually companies who are using this chatter. Think of it like Facebook. You have a profile. Uh, information comes to you on a feed. You opt into what you want to have uh, delivered to you very differently than mail, which tends to be single thread. You can communicate in groups and those kinds of things. So it's very personal. And so what's happening is, is that these companies are having a couple of major shifts. The first one is, is that um, it's full transparency. So you can find out, just like you find out about your friends on Facebook, you can find out what's happening in your company, which means a very interesting thing happens. We call it the rise of the individual contributor. And it's not just us. There are lots of sociologists who are studying uh, this as well. And so in the old, you know, you would think about somebody who had a really good idea. How does that idea get surfaced in a business? Now, uh, my personal feeling is, is that women have a lot of good ideas. So what if your idea carries the same weight as the person who's at the top of the food chain? So I think it's a tremendous opportunity. The second one that I would say is one of the big choices that we as females make is do we want to leave work and go home and have kids for a while and then maybe how it's very difficult for us today with the hierarchical organizations and kind of this uh, way you stay out of touch. You kind of fall out of touch and it's very difficult to get back into whatever your career path was. And so I think that these enterprise social networks as well as all of this network community allows people to stay in touch and stay current. And if you have a culture that recognizes individual contributors, which I believe is the way that the world will go and has been going, you're going to be able to come back at the same, not necessarily, it won't matter whether you come back at the managerial level that decides your value, your salary, your capability, your job role, but individuals will come back into the um, enterprise maybe 10 years after having kids and getting them through a very important thing that we all care about, building a family, and they can come right back in and be just as effective going forward. And then I think the last one is, is that one of the experiences that we're having is, and I think most of our customers, is that the walls between organizations break down. Women are very good at organizing projects, executing them, and uh, then you know working in a group very socially, and then turning around and saying, okay, I'll stay in touch with you, but I'm gonna go over and do this other thing in another group over here. They're very good at that. And that's the way that people are gonna be able to generate value, come up with new product ideas, uh, complete projects in the um, future going forward. Great. So you all have tremendous insight through your work into how women think, how they behave, what motivates them. What do you recommend are effective ways to target and engage women? 
Uh, and do these techniques apply universally to men as well? well? I don't know if I have an answer exactly to that, but I think there's just a lot of opportunity to create products that do engage women. And so one area that we've seen that really, and I think the rise in the Facebook gaming kind of has, has really shown this, is we hear from women all over the world, all walks of life, how busy they are. And so it's just a feeling of just not having enough time. And these are, you know, stay-at-home moms, these are executives, these are all kinds of women. It's just a general sense there's too much to do. And I think right now that a lot of the applications that are being created for certain types of systems really require a lot of attention. So if you think about gaming consoles, so if you want to sit down and play a video game, you have to spend one, two hours actually playing that game to get to your next level. But I think what women really are looking for more online are like snacks. So we've been coming up with these ideas of snacks where you can get, you can pop in, do something, and pop back out. So designing for snacks. And I think Zynga has done this quite well. So Farmville, you just you go, you feed your cow, you feed your pig. I haven't played it very much, so I don't know exactly what I'm talking about. But it doesn't require such a huge commitment in time. And so I think if we could design more for that, if we could design to fit more into women's lives versus designing products that they have to come to, I think adoption rates are going to go up, and it just makes good business because women have, they have the buying power, they have the capacity, so we should just be focusing on them. So that's my two cents. <laughs> I, I would add that, you know, it's a different model. On, I'm talking about online mostly. It's a different model now where you're, you're, every goal shouldn't be to drag drag and lure women to your destination because they're already out there at their own destinations and at their friends' destinations and having a perfectly good time. And being out where they are, reaching them where they are on blogs, on Facebook and Twitter, but also realizing all social media is not the same. Our purpose, and we've done four years in a row, an annual study just on women and social media usage and why they use it and what they use. Our purpose for using Facebook is actually different than our purpose when we blog and our purpose when we use Twitter. If you treat them all the same, you're actually missing not a chance to, uh, it's not like I think you're going to make anybody angry. You're just going to not be on their radar. On Facebook, to Ilana's point, our main two purposes are to keep in touch with friends and family and to have fun and entertain ourselves. So yeah, if you want to connect with people on Facebook as a human or give them some kind of fun experience, that's the right way. It's not where someone's going to go for a substantive product review. And, and, and also, by the way, what you do on Facebook, uh, what people talk about on Facebook isn't that visible in search. So people still, you know, start with a Google search mostly before they purchase. And so you want content in different places doing different things to be found at different times. It's a, it's a much more complex world than saying, oh, I, I got to create a Facebook page because that's social media. I'm done. Um, and, and remember where w women are in a lot of different places and they're really interested in interaction and community. That's the main, you know, driving goal. I mean, yeah, and then to support that, of course, you know, uh, maybe I'm speaking for, for my company, but still research is always here to prove, you know, from A to Z where to reach them. Um, so it's not only women, but men also how to better reach them also because you need to also to have a relevant message. And it's all about the relev relevancy about where they, where they spend their time. But you know, do you deliver also the, uh, uh, the good message, like a relevant message that will uh, have some, some effect on it, on, on, the, on the target group. So this is all about, you know, the research will go from A to Z because the knowledge is power. And so if you have that, that knowledge of, uh, of your target group and your target audience, then of course you know better how to um, just to use the tools you have handy to just to better reach them and maybe deliver more um, um, well, eventually, it's like maybe more sales. You know, if, if you're in a in a consumer world, but that's that's uh, yeah, research would be key. I, also, oh, sorry. I was going to say, I think there's one other area that maybe from a corporate perspective, a bit more. I, I think that we're also innovating into a new uh, model for corporate philanthropy, and integrating philanthropy into um, our corporations. That's certainly something, obviously, that Google's done very successfully. We do. People donate their time. We give our employees time off. We provide equity in the use of our service. And I think so for each one of us, it's our own responsibility to think about how we, not from a target to sell, but a target to mentor, to develop, to give people opportunity. And um, I think for those of you that are either starting a company or maybe you work in one now, I would proactively take a role in identifying and finding new talent, uh, entrepreneurs, 
uh, folks who really want to contribute to the workforce and uh, take it as a personal responsibility to integrate that into something that you do every day or every week, et cetera. Yeah, I was just going to add that I don't think the technology and the tracking and, and metrics are good enough yet for online. We don't really understand, and I know both Comscore and your competitors are working on various ways to improve this. You know, from the first click to the last click to the offline purchase, um, all of that. They've had 50, 60 years to work out that when they show a TV commercial in this regional area and then they track sales, they have a lot of data to support when a TV commercial has impact. It may be hard for the rest of us to understand how they can connect it to that, but there's a lot of data and methodology that allows them to extrapolate that that has not been built up yet on the web. And that's why the dollars have not yet followed the eyeballs to the web. Ultimately, the technology will improve and ultimately those, those dollars will come. But I do want to point out that per our research, people are still watching TV more than anything. The uh, traditional media from a business mo model point of view may have a lot of issues, but traditional media from a usage point of view is doing okay. Consumers actually still really love to watch TV. We still listen to the radio. We still wa uh, read newspapers and, and magazines. You know, how the shift in making money is going to happen, I guess if I had that answer, I'd be a very rich consultant. But, um, but our consumers are just multitasking with media, and we're very media hungry. We're everywhere. Which reinforces Ilana's assertion that we need to be designing snacks for women. Snacks, that's what we need. Thank you all for coming to DLD Women and sharing your insights with us. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Irene.